Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to a special Scott Logic webinar where we celebrate LGBT History Month. And I'm delighted to be joined by special guest LGBTQ plus historian, tour guide, and escape room designer, Sasha Coward. Sasha, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Really looking forward to this. Good stuff. So Sasha has been working in museums and heritage for over 10 years, exploring the lives of queer people that often fall between the gap. He's also a keen gamer, and he believes that video games have become a legitimate art form. So if you'd like to ask Sasha a question, do get your questions into the Q&A box and we'll take as many as we can at the end. But without further ado, let me pass you over to your speaker for today, Sasha. Hello, uh, welcome and thank you for uh, spending your morning uh, with us and, you know, getting up early to do a bit of history. Hopefully this is going to be a slightly different take on history. Now, the talk is called Space Invaders. Now, if you've played a video game or know anything about it, video games, you'll know that's a reference to a classic video game. But I also chose it as a bit of a pun because being LGBTQ+, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or queer, and working in or being involved in video games in any way can often feel a bit like you are invading spaces. You're taking up space that isn't always meant for you or wasn't designed designed for you. Uh, before we get into the talk, one thing I do want to say is I will be using the word queer a hell of a lot. Now, the word queer is, for some people, a very divisive term. Now, when I grew up and I was going to school in the 90s, the word queer was both an insult and an identity. So it's a complex word for me, but it's something that I've come to love and align with. But for some people, because of their experiences, very understandably, that's not a word they like to use to describe themselves because it feels like an insult. It feels like hate. Now, when I use the word queer, I'm using it as an umbrella term to refer to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer queer, intersex, asexual, all of those words in one big bundle. If you don't like that word and wouldn't want to use it yourself, just transpose LGBTQ plus every time I say the word queer. That's absolutely fine. The other thing to mention is that I am a cisgender, white, middle class gay man. So you are getting a very specific um, perspective on queer history. You're not getting the full perspective. If you were to speak to a non-binary person, a queer person of color, you would probably get a very different take on video games. And I would really recommend you reaching out and looking for more diverse people who speak on this topic as well. Kind of doing myself out of a job, but it is important to say. So at the very end of the talk, I will be talking a little bit about some video game designers, journalists, people who are involved with games who have different identities to myself and it might be worth checking them out. So to jump into the talk, this is my only vanity slide, I promise. This is the only bit where I talk about myself, but you do need to know who I am as a speaker first. So my name is Sasha Coward. My pronouns are he, him. I've been working in museums for about a decade now, every single job you can imagine. My first museum job was working in a gift shop in Colorado, selling plastic dinosaurs. So I've done the whole gamut of museum jobs. But my passion and my speciality is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer history. So it is the stories of people that often fall through the cracks. Now I do tours. I also build escape rooms because I'm a big nerd. I like to be involved with Museum Pride London, which is the group of people that march at Pride that work in museums. I've made videos over lockdown. Basically, I love to just get any opportunity to work in spaces I find fascinating and talking about topics I love. So that middle image at the top there, for example, that's the British Museum. I've done a video game themed tour there. Uh, the bit, uh, image below is the Museum of London. I did a video game themed tour of their collection as well. Because as well as being a museum nerd and a queer historian, I am a video gamer. I've been playing video games probably since I was six years old in some capacity. And they have offered me a wealth of joy and occasionally frustration. And it's something that I want to kind of share and to start to respect a bit more. 
Now, if you are coming to this talk and you do not play games and you do not identify as a gamer, that is absolutely fine. You do not need to know about anything about video games to enjoy or get something from this talk. The one thing I would say, and the one place where I am uns unshakable and unmovable is the fact that video games are art. They are a form of art, which is as valid as a painting, as a museum collection, as a dance piece or opera, any of those things. Now, as an example, drawing on opera, that's an art form that I have never fully got. Maybe I've not seen the correct opera. Maybe I haven't seen it in the right setting or I haven't met the right person to give me an introduction to it. But just because personally I don't connect with opera and I don't go and see it doesn't mean that opera isn't fascinating and important. That's exactly the same with video games. So even if you don't play them, I want to present the case that they are an incredibly vital form of human culture and expression. Now, this image here is from the game Minecraft. As you can see, someone has reconstructed the entire Mona Lisa uh, by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, pixel by pixel, block by block in Minecraft. And to the top right, you can see the ring from Lord of the Rings as well. People are spending thousands of hours, not just building games and creating these games, but building and playing within these games, creating and enjoying these worlds. That's the interesting thing about video games. It's a two-way art form. So part of the talk is to explain that video games are important and the representation of people in video games is incredibly important. Now to quote a uh, video game designer and author, Jane McGonigal, in her book, Reality is Broken, she said, Gamers have had enough of reality. They are abandoning it in droves, a few hours here, an entire weekend there, sometimes every spare minute of every day for stretches at a time in favor of simulated environments and online games. Maybe you are one of these gamers. If not, then you definitely know some of them. So games are big and they're not going anywhere. As an example of that, if we look at the chart on the bottom right, you will see the amount of money that video games make versus films and music. If we go back to 2001, we can see they're roughly on the same sort of level, right? The, the amount of money that's being raked in by these industries is comparable. By 2021, the video game industry is currently worth more than the music and the film industry added together and doubled. So that just shows you how much money, how much clout there is in video games. In terms of the makeup of who plays video games, there's still this very old school, very 90s idea that video game players are men, they're nerdy men, and, you know, either teenage boys or nerdy men still living at home with their mum. Now, uh, nerdy people like myself do make up video game audiences, but as you can see, the measurement at the moment shows 46% of video game players are women. Now, to my non-binary attendees, I apologize. A lot of the statistics that are collected around video games are very binary. So we don't know how many people within these numbers would also classify somewhere within that spectrum. But what it shows is it's not quite a 50-50 split. You know, men still kind of control a lot of the video game industry. It's still not a particularly safe space not to be a cisgender man in the video game industry but it's still getting getting there, getting very close to 50-50. And in terms of the makeup, if we look at age demographics and gender, we can see that the biggest demographic is men aged between 21 and 35. But the next two biggest demographics are both groups of women. And in fact, more women aged between 36 and 50 are playing games than men. So the stereotype of gamers is wrong, right? You need to push that out your head. Everybody is playing video games and they have power. They have significance, particularly with young people. These are some of their first experiences playing in worlds or places or environments which they haven't gone into in the real world and they're experiencing it through this virtual medium. We are telling these people a lot about what we think about what it is to be human through how we re represent people in these games. So if we have really rubbish or non-existent representation of queer people in games, that we are giving a very strong message to the people, particularly the young people that are playing those games. 
So now I'm going to give you a potted history of video games going all the way from 1985 to 2023 focusing on representation of queer people. Now, if you know anything about video games, arguably video games have been around since the 1960s, depending on what you define as a video game. Um, but in terms of representation of lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people, we don't really see anything until 1985. Prior to this, we're playing with little pixels. Generally, these pixels don't even have a character. Maybe they have a gender. If they do, they're probably a man. They're little very simple games. We're talking classic Space Invaders. Uh, we're talking like uh, Pac-Man. Very, very simplistic games. Now, little warning, content warning. Even though these are video games, and a lot of them are ridiculous, some of the content is quite challenging and even upsetting. And the very first example, by the way, is, is a really problematic example. Uh, so little warning for misogyny, for homophobia, transphobia, and also sadly racism in some of the earlier games. So this game, uh, the crime de parking, my French is atrocious. I apologize hugely. Uh, was created in 1985 by a French video game company. Uh, it's a company called Froggy Software. Now, I don't feel embarrassed about saying this. Uh, Froggy Software uh, created some terrible games. Uh, terrible in the way that they had no respect for the people they were representing in the games. This image of a naked woman dead in a shopping trolley is the main cover of the cartridge that you would buy for this game in 1985. It is a murder mystery. It is about a woman who is murdered and found in a cartridge and uh, found in a shopping cart. Again, highly sexualized, despite being the fact that she is a murder victim. Um, a really gross image, to be honest. But the storyline is you go around and you try to find out who killed her. And you meet all kinds of different characters. Uh, one of the characters you meet is a man called Paco. Uh, Paco works at a, um, uh, a tailor uh, and he makes clothes and is just codified as being gay. He's incredibly camp. He comes onto you, floppy wrist. Everything about him is screaming gay stereotype. It's not just gay people who are stereotyped in this, um, in this story. You go to a furniture shop where you meet this really unpleasantly racist caricature of a black man. Every single minority you can think of gets a bad representation in this game. But the interesting point to mention is this is one of the first representations of a gay character, Paco, who you later um, arrest because it turns out, spoilers, he is the um, he is the, the murderer who did it because he was jealous because everyone liked this woman. Uh, so the story we're getting is that gay men are mad and dangerous, and this kind of continues for some time. You can see there, triste fin pour un dandy. Uh, a sad end for the dandy is the end of this game. And it's not just this game that they produced. In the same year, they also produced another uh, game called Le Meur de Berlin Vassauteur. Uh, again, my French is terrible. I never studied French. Uh, but in this game, yet again, who is the bad guy? Well, the bad guy is a warlord in this game um, and is yet again a gay man. Representations of gay men are basically through camp stereotypes that you come across in a bar. And at one point you go into a sauna where this kind of large kind of semi-nude man starts coming onto your character. 90, so um, Froggy Software definitely had it in for a lot of minorities, but they had a special kind of hatred for gay men. Now, in 1986, we get the next bit of representation, which is in a game called Moon Mist. Yet again, a murder mystery, very big in the 80s. This was a text adventure, so you would write what you wanted to do next. Do you want to eat the sandwich? Yes or no? You type in what you want to do. And in this game, there's multiple different endings, but one of them involves a character called Vivian Pentreath. Now, Vivian Pentry turns out in one of the lines to be the murderer um, who kills the man for mistreating a woman that she loves. And it turns out that Vivian is basically a kind of lunatic um, serial killer. And to finish the game, you have to kill Vivian. First representation we have of a lesbian woman with a ridiculous name like Vivian Pentreath. And of course, she is a murderer and her love for another woman has driven her mad. Again, these are the stories that we're telling about queer people. In 1980s, this is very much mirroring the same representations that we have in films of the time. 
We now come to 1988. And if you're chuckling right now, I do not blame you. Um, as a respectable historian who's worked in museums, there is a bizarre experience of having to explore the gender identity of a pink dinosaur from the 80s. But there's more to this than me. So this is Birdo from the Super Mario uh, franchise. Um, Birdo, uh, when the manual was first released, it described as following. He thinks he is a girl and he spits eggs from his mouth. He'd rather be called Birdetta. The first time that we know of in a video game where there is a representation of a non-cisgender character. Now, this is not a respectable representation of a trans character. This is a ridiculous pink dinosaur. And clearly the manual is writing this description for comedic effect. It was later removed from the game because Nintendo have a very strong family-friendly policy, which they believe means that the representation of trans and queer people should not exist. But since this, Birdo has appeared in many other games. And then since the original description, Birdo has now become a cis female pink dinosaur in that the reference to uh, he or thinking he is a girl has completely disappeared. And in fact, sometimes Birdo is paired with Yoshi, uh, the character favorite um, Super Mario's dinosaur steed. But because of this backstory, even though it's really negative, Birdo has become, for some queer people, a bit of an icon. Like, she's kind of become a trans icon, even if this story was offensive and then later erased. 1989, first mostly positive story that I've got for you. So this is a game that was released by a woman called CM. We don't know uh, CM Ralph's uh, first name. She's quite a secretive character, uh, but she worked at Silicon Valley back in the late 90s. So imagine being a lesbian woman working in Silicon Valley at this time period. But as a side project, she produced her own game, which she called Caper in the Castro. Now, the Castro, if you don't know, is a district of San Francisco, which is basically the LGBT hub of San Francisco, an already very queer space. And so the game that CM created was generally written for her friends and for other people that she knew, uh, where she included loads of references uh, to like LGBT in jokes. So we've got this here, sheesh, what, sheesh, what a dyke. Uh, this is written by a lesbian woman. So there is a kind of self kind of referential humor. The main character is called Tracker McDyke. Um, and Tracker McDyke, the story is trying to find the drag queen who's been murdered, who's a very good friend, uh, trying to find out who done it. And so this game was shared with a lot of LGBT people living, um, particularly in San Francisco, but around America. And in doing so, whilst sharing this game, this was during the height of the HIV epidemic in America, um, CM encouraged people, everyone that bought one of these floppy disks, to donate to an HIV charity, which is amazing. So this is one of the first examples of a queer game created by and for a queer um, audience. And you'll see, though, there is a bit of a twist to this story, that there are two examples of this cartridge. One is called Casper in the Ca Cas uh, Caper in the Castro. But the image on the right is called Murder on Main Street. Both were released in the same year. But Murder on Main Street was the game that was released uh, more publicly when a video game producer said they wanted uh, to release this game because the graphics were great for the time. Uh, but they did wanted every single LGBT reference removed. And so that's what happened. Murder on Main Street is Caper in the Castro with all the queer stuff taken out of it so that it would not offend the average audience. Murder on Main Street was the mainstream game, even though it came second. I do think that maybe CM is putting in a bit of a joke when she says Main Street, like mainstream. Hmm, I think there's something in that. Sadly, she had to rewrite the character. So the silhouetted androgynous figure, who's originally Tracker McDyke, now becomes a man, now becomes a stereotypical detective. So it's a bit of a sad thing that she had to erase this, but we can still play the original Caper in the Castro. If you Google it, you can find it on the LGBT Digital Archive, and you can actually play it from your laptop without um, downloading any software because it's such a small game. 1991, so we're now in the 90s. So uh, this is an example, and apologies to my trans friends, this is a horrible example, um, from Street Fighter. Uh, this is a game that was originally called Final Fight. Uh, the character we're going to be talking about is called Poison. 
Now, Poison in the original Japanese version, you'll see with the bright pink hair, um, is a character, an evil character that you fight. She's kind of semi-naked and wears high heels, a lot of these kinds of characters. And you're encouraged to basically fight her, beat her up as a male character. Now, when this was released in the US and also in European editions, there was a big outcry that this character of Poison was encouraging violence against women. The idea this was a woman that you were being encouraged to fight as a male protagonist. So they went two different directions. The um, Nintendo uh, consoles, they changed the character. They rewrote the character to make it a man called either Billy or Sid. But the Sega version of the console, they kept the basic character, made her look more or less similar, covered her up a little bit more. But they said this wasn't violence against women because this was a transgender woman. Therefore, it was absolutely fine to beat her up. So let's just be clear here that violence against women was not the case because this character was turned into a transgender woman, which is acceptable to be beating up. That was the message we were communicating in the early 90s. Now, since then, Poison has appeared in many more modern games. She's continued to appear. The trans background to her, her character has continued to be there. She continues to be a character who is a transgender woman. Now, just to be very clear, in the Japanese versions, even the more modern games, they use a term uh, which roughly translates as new half, which is an equivalent to a slur that is used against trans women um, here in English. Um, and also, if you look at her design, it's still highly sexualized. This is not necessarily an empowering character. That being said, a number of trans women, just as queer people do, we find those characters, we know they're problematic, but we sort of kind of make them our own and we take them on all the same. So she definitely does have a following, even though I would argue her backstory is incredibly dark. When we come to uh, 1994, uh, we come to a game called Mother 2, which appeared on the uh, Nintendo consoles. Uh, and it's an RPG, very strange game, but quite wonderful game. And in it, there is a character called Tony. Now, Tony is very, very affectionate towards your main character, uh, Ness and repeatedly says how how emotionally attached he is to you, how much he loves you, how much he cares about you. And in this sequence, uh, sequence, I just dreamt that you and I were taking a walk together. Now, it's never said in the game specifically that this is a queer character, but the creator Shigesato Itoi said, "There's a gay person in Mother Two, a really passionate friend who lives in an England-like place. I designed him to be a gay child. In a normal, real-life society, there are gay children, and I have many gay friends as well. So I thought it would be nice to add one in the game too. Now, this is actually huge for 1994 to have not just a gay character written by a heterosexual man." In Japan, where there are some very regressive still laws around representations of queerness in family games, and that this is a child is a very big deal. That is actually a huge step forward in some ways. By 1997, we have the lights of Final Fantasy. This is Final Fantasy VII. Uh, the original game has a couple of sequences that are very, very strongly queer coded. One of which when the lead character Cloud has to cross dress to impress this sleazy kind of brothel owner man. And the interesting thing is you can really invest in this storyline. If you do it really, really hard, you actually end up becoming the belle of the ball and you outcompete uh, two cis women uh, for the affections of this horrible person. Again, this is played for jokes, right? This is played for humor, it is not respectful, but for a number of queer people who are exploring their gender identity, to be able to have an ostensibly male protagonist put on clothes and express themselves as a woman and be seen as a woman is quite an interesting experience, at least in the 90s. There's also a ridiculous sequence uh, where you basically go to a bodybuilding convention or pretty much compete with a bunch of bodybuilders who look at the moustaches, look at the tank tops. They are clearly coded to be queer. Now, there is a bit more to the story. Only a couple of years ago, this game has been remastered and done in glorious new graphics. And you can play Final Fantasy VII Part One right now. And it has these sequences kept in the game, except they sort of built on it a bit. So the moment where Cloud dresses and you know, dresses a woman and tries to impress um, this man, you can go even deeper in it. And the, the 
The facial expression on cloud is an interesting one. They don't play it just for jokes. People say how beautiful he looks in that position. And there's also a whole song sung by this bisexual compare about identity and being who you want to be. It's still silly. It's still very, very silly, but they are clearly addressing this from a slightly more modern perspective. 1999, and we are talking about possibly my favorite game of all time. And this is uh, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Now, there's a really interesting, and apologies, this game is now very old. So if you've not played it and I'm ruining it for you, you might want to just cover your ears for five seconds. Uh, so when you grow up as an adult, uh, Princess Zelda, the eponymous Zelda, who up until this point has always basically been a princess in the tower that you were trying to rescue, takes on an alternative identity and becomes a character known as Sheik. Sheik appears in this androgynous form with a bound chest, uh, kind of based on a sort of ninja style, uh, clearly very athletic, very physical, helps link the main character on his journey, and then only later reveals that this is another identity of Princess Zelda. Now, for a lot of people, particularly non-binary, uh, butch lesbians, uh, trans men, that have taken ownership of this character because it could be read in many different directions. And a lot of people think that this is an example of Princess Zelda playing with her gender, which is a really interesting thing, particularly in the 1999. Now, this is an example of a video game franchise not needing to do more, they needed to do less. Nintendo felt the need to put out an official statement saying the definitive answer is that Sheik is a woman, simply Zelda in a different outfit. Now that's really annoying because that just that boils down the entire complexity of gender identity into something very, very simple in, in terms of putting on or taking off a dress, which is not at all what non-binary fans were seeing in the character of Sheik. And despite that, Sheik is still seen by many people, myself included. I see Sheik as a really cool example of a non-binary or trans man auto identity um, of, um, of Princess Zelda. But the thing with Nintendo, and we'll see this coming up over and over again, is they have this family-friendly framework, which they understand to mean that you cannot really have queer, openly queer characters in their games. There are a few, we'll come to those later, and that everything needs to be very much focused on men being men and women being women. And any bend to this has to be humorous. It can never be played too seriously. By 1999, we have the release of The Sims. <coughs> Pardon me. In this game, you basically are able to play God uh, over a family, build a house, uh, construct their entire lives, their jobs, make them miserable or happy. But also within it, you can have relationships between two people of the same gender. They can get married and they can have a child. Now, this is huge. I was playing this game in 1999 as a young gay, I, mean, I was 13. I didn't really think I was gay, but I knew there was something going on there. I knew that I kept making houses with two men who were in relationships with each other. And they could get married before I would have been allowed to get married. Marriage wasn't legal in the UK and in most parts of America at this stage. And yet in The Sims, they were already modeling a society that didn't actually exist in the real world. Now, that being said, they still have a gender binary. Your Sims are either a man or a woman. Um, and it's basically a template where they've just, they've left it in almost rather than added an extra layer of queer content. They just haven't removed the ability for two same gender Sims to get married. That being said, uh, there, there is a leading Maxis, the creators of The Sims, uh, game developer, um, who is a gay man. And I think that definitely had some input. But for many people, The Sims, myself included, The Sims was a playground where you could create families and relationships and people that you couldn't quite be yet. So I was creating the relationships. I was not really able to even think into reality yet. And so I'm, I'm really thankful for those experiences. 2003, so jumping on a few years, we have Star Wars The Old Republic. 
Now, this is a really important moment because we are still talking about representation of LGBTQ plus people in big franchises like Star Wars today, right? And arguably in some of the newer films, there is a possibly a same-sex kiss between two women somewhere in the background. Uh, you know, there's allusions to things every now and then. Uh, but in 2003, so we're talking, you know, just under 20 years ago, the very first canon representation of a queer Star Wars character. I haven't read all the books, so if I'm wrong, you can tell me otherwise. But at least produced by, by LucasArts, um, this is the video game which has the character of Jahani. Now, Jahani is an alien, a slightly cat-like alien, uh, who you can meet. And if your character is a woman, she may romance you. You may actually be able to form a romantic relationship with Jahani. But if your character is a man, again, this is a game with binary genders, uh, she will not initiate a relationship with you. Now, there is a bit of a dark thing going on here. If you look down on the bottom right, you'll see there's a whole set of text, and it says DLG editor. Well, a lot of men did not take nicely to this. So they actually hacked into the game, rewrote the code of Jahani so that she would romance you even if you had a male character, if you had a man as your main character. Now, this is really dark. Now, it's really silly. This is a cat, a lesbian cat alien in Star Wars. I hear you. I know that this is silly. This may not seem like legitimate history. But let's think of the mindset of young men believing they can recode someone's identity so that they will have sex with them, basically. There's, there's something about this entitlement that if it is in any way transposed onto reality becomes incredibly dark and problematic. So 2004, we have Fable. Uh, Fable is another game where you get to sort of choose your character and build a story for them, this time in a fantasy world, sort of D&D inspired adventure environment. What's really interesting is as you play the game, uh, a number of things get tracked, including a uh, number of spouses, a uh, number of times you've had sex, number of times you've been widowed, and also your sexuality. So the way they do this, if you are, let's say, a, a man, if you play the character of a man, if you have a relationship with a woman, your sexuality will now be labeled as heterosexual. If you then sleep with a man, it will now be labeled as bisexual. Once you are bisexual, it will never change again. Now, what is problematic about this is based on real life. I had a girlfriend when I was 12. A number of gay, and, uh, gay, gay men and women have had similar experiences. I now define as a gay man. Just because I had a relationship or a kiss or a fling at some point does not mean that my identity is bisexual. That's not what it means to be bisexual. So it's kind of like they were trying very hard, but they didn't really realize that bisexual isn't just like a brand that gets put on you once you've slept of more than one gender. Now that's who you are. That sexuality is something in your head. It is not something necessarily, it's not just a behavior. It's the interaction between the two. But hey, they were trying, sort of. So I've skipped a hell of a bit here. Now, there are a number of games that now pop up because we're now getting into the sort of 2000s, 2010s. There's a lot of more representations, but I would say they all fall into the categories that we've looked at so far. Some of them really problematic, some of them really stereotypical, some of them sort of empowering, some of them trying, but maybe getting a few things wrong. I would say the next big milestone is 2013 with the release of The Last of Us. Now, The Last of Us has... Uh, two kind of protagonists, although you mainly pay, play as one of them. But one of the main characters is Ellie. She is the younger uh, girl, teenage girl holding the gun on the cover. Ellie is a lesbian. She is written as a lesbian in the DLC. She has a, a shared kiss with another woman who, uh, again, spoilers, very quickly is killed by zombies uh, because, of course, bury your dead is one of the stereotypes we see a lot in games. As soon as someone shows that they are gay and has a relationship, at least one of them has to die. But it also has the character of Bill. And I find Bill a really interesting character. He's the picture down below. He's really aggressive. He's really surly. He's, he's an absolute, if I can say so, a bit of a bastard. Um, very, very macho. And he's also gay. 
and it's not really made a huge deal out of the relationship that he had with another man clearly fell apart and it was really problematic because Bill's not a very nice guy but I actually really liked it I liked seeing like wow you've made this character who you would not normally stereotypically be read as gay who's also not particularly nice but isn't evil because of their sexuality. I found that very interesting. And for many people, Ellie was incredibly empowering to have a young person, a teenager who was a lesbian, outspoken and empowered and beloved by many, many people in a zombie apocalypse of all franchises. This is not where we were necessarily expecting to have empowered queer representation. In 2000 and 14 we have dragon age inquisition um so we have the character of clem so this is a character who is written as a transgender man voiced by a trans man as well and what i like about this is this is not a character who just tells you hi i'm trans this is my backstory this is a character who has an entire complex backstory and if you get to know them and if you earn their trust they might tell you about this part of their you know really really difficult part of their past but it's not forefront now they're not perfect in terms of trans representation but many trans people and non-binary people have found a lot of affiliation with this character so the image in the middle for example is a cosplayer where we go to festivals and things we dress up as our favorite characters let's just remember that for queer people for ages we've not had characters that we can get obsessed with and we can identify with so having a trans man character in a franchise like dragon age is really really cool you also have the like on the far right i am ball the guy who basically looks like every gym meathead i've ever met uh but like huge muscular dude and he's bisexual again subverting expectations of gender and sexuality which is quite fun i am I'm going to touch on one of my favorite games of all time again this is ridiculous we're going to be talking about cartoon bugs um you know me a credited historian uh but this is the game hollow knight i think hollow knight is amazing for subtle queer representation so the main character you play is the knight with the little bone helmet thing um the knight is not gendered everyone describes you as being non-gendered you are not he or you are not she so a non-binary protagonist there are ab uh, characters like cloth who's a little bug on the top left with a club uh she when you speak to her and get to know her you know that she's fighting um for kind of she wants to go on an adventure to go on a fight for courage and bravery but she also has left her girlfriend back home you have the gray mourner, the image on the bottom left is based around a cockroach and she wants you to leave flowers at the grave of her girlfriend. And then you have the likes of the two, the ironsmith and the swordsmith who um, are two male characters who, if you play things for a certain way, end up together and they create artworks together, painting each other, posing for sculptures. And when you do it, you unlock this achievement, which is called the perfect couple. In 2020, and we will mention it again at some point, we have the sequel to The Last of Us. This caused a huge amount of controversy and we'll be talking about it in a bit. But again, Naughty Dog, the creators of The Last of Us, can be crit criticized for a number of things, um, but their representation is really, really interesting. So we have the lights of uh, Lev on the right there, who is a young trans man who goes with one of your characters characters we see the character of ellie grow up and she has a relationship with another woman a bisexual woman who is pregnant it is a whole sense of exploring the complexities of queer relationships as well and then we have abby top left now abby is a cisgender heterosexual woman as far as we can tell um but what the, why this is done played as a kind of queer note is just that her body type is so non-gender normative that when people were looking at the stills, they presumed, because they heard there was trans representation, they presumed that Abby was going to be the trans character. Abby is not trans. She's just showing a different kind of body type to what we usually see when we look at cis women. And so there is an exploration of Naughty Dog just playing with the understanding that, that queerness is complicated and it's not just about who you sleep with and what gender you identify with. And finally, I think this is one of the final ones, we have um, Hades, uh, which is a game based on ancient Greece and is one of the first games I've seen based, based on ancient Greece, which as a historian accurately shows 
the the queerness of ancient Greek mythology and culture. So the main character Zagreus um, is biromantic, so can initiate relationships with men and women. Uh, we have the likes of Achilles and Patroclus, uh, two canonically queer lovers who are, you know, basically going through a really rough time in their in in their their relationship with each other, but it's not in any way hidden that they were together. And then you have Orpheus and Eurydice, who particularly Orpheus is coded in a very non-binary aspect, kind of not um, necessarily your stereotypical man. Their relationship is, is done through this queer, slightly trans lens, which is really, really cool. So that was the whistle stop tour of history. We're now going to talk a little bit about some of the more tricky stuff, what's going on in the industry. Now, I am going to use the example of The Last of Us because it is a really good example to talk about how people respond to these representations. Now, The Last of Us sold gangbusters, did incredibly well, sold with all kinds of awards. But it is fascinating and disturbing to me that Ellie, who is a lesbian character, the person who plays um, Ellie knows that she's a lesbian character. Ellie, the character, basically talks about lesbian experiences and the game develop developers have said and confirmed that Ellie is a lesbian. And yet people who played the games still do not want to believe that Ellie is a lesbian. Imagining that her kiss was just an experimental game or that she just doesn't feel like a lesbian character. And the reason is, I think, is because she's a beloved character. People love her and they cannot quite put together a lot of cis heterosexual younger gamers, um, particularly men, that this character they really associate with is also a lesbian, something they find really problematic and frightening. Now, the sequel to The Last of Us is a fascinating thing that happened. Um, the critical review, so the meta score based on all the different critics, is 95 out of 100. This is a very high score for a video game, um, means it becomes a must-play game. The user score is 3.4 out of 10. Now, there are many times when critics and gamers disagree on the game, but to this degree is very very rare. This screen cap was originally taken before the game was released to the general public. So the critics had all played a version of this game, but everyday people like you and me had not played this game. So where did 5,015 ratings pushing it down to 3.4? Well, it's a thing we called review bombing, where people will take to um, generally organize on websites like 4chan, and will take to a video game and basically bomb it with bad reviews. In this case, even though not a single person had played the game. The reason being because they had seen images of Abby looking muscular. They did not like that. They saw that there was going to be a trans character and that um, there was going to be a further exploration of Ellie's sexuality. And all of these elements meant that this game got hated on to a degree that is so extreme. We're talking death threats to some of the game developers and game reviewers. Really, really extreme. Game representation has so many problematic examples. Like, for example, the Persona series, uh, bottom right, that image, a fantastic series of games. I love Persona. But the two gay men that appear in the most recent Persona game are horrible. They're basically child molesters. And this is played as this is just what gay men are like. In Resident Evil, we have the trope that if you are a transgender person, you're also a serial killer. We have this weird lack of understanding. You feel like a lot of the time the people making these games have never met a gay or trans person in their life. Where you have these muscular but effeminate characters who are both like really predatory, but also very cowardly, um, really mixed together. And then you have, of course, the disturbing fact that the alt-right have been producing their own games as well. For example, one game that encourages you to shoot up an incredibly offensive representation of a gay pride parade, which is basically a bunch of naked men walking around with a rainbow flag and erect penises. We have The Legend of Zelda, again, my favorite franchise, the newest game, uh, where the only character canonically that seems to show some sort of queer element to them only comes on to you when you take all your clothes off. It's this kind of really banal, low level representation. And uh, we'll come on to that a little bit later. We also have 
the complex issue of queer coding. Now, this has been discussed a lot in film. So, for example, the way in which Dracula or vampires often are coded as being very camp and extravagant and clearly embodying a gay or queer aesthetic. Well, for example, in Skyward Sword, one of the Zelda games, we have the character of Girahim. We also have the character of Bayonetta, where sexually suggestive imagery, androgyny, hints to S&M and certain fashion elements, uh, which are linking to drag, are used to make this character look edgy, look cool, look dark, look dangerous. And so as queer people, we see these characters and we're very aware where these tropes have been borrowed from. In some ways, these characters are really offensive because they are never overtly queer. They don't actually explore queerness in, in any depth. They're just done as basically a cool look, an aesthetic, and never acknowledged or respected. At the same time, both Bayonetta and Girahim have a huge LGBT following because we know what's going on there. And so we sort of take these characters and we tell our own stories. We go, okay, well, let's just say Girahim is canonically they are a non-binary person we've decided that don't worry nintendo you try to push the aesthetic we're going to go all the way and we're going to say the bayonetta is you know a bisexual who was originally a lesbian but is now exploring ddsm we create these ridiculous stories and see humor in the ridiculous ridiculousness of queer coding being a, uh, a writer or a journalist or anything in video games is really, really scary. Like even giving this talk, I gave this talk on a Twitch stream and I had to be really, really careful about who was allowed to access my details because talking about representations, not just of LGBT people, but of women, of people of color, it creates such a backlash from people. So for example, this is on Twitter, Feminist Frequency uh, make a whole series of videos uh, based on feminist uh, representation of women and representation of queer people in video games. And they said, you deserve to die for all your hate against men and video games. I will kill you. These kinds of messages are so extreme. Someone on the game development forum that I found was writing, will the inclusion of LGBT characters in my game detract from possible sales? People are very seriously considering removing us so that they don't incite outrage. EA, a huge video game company, received thousands of hate letters when they included an LGBTQ character or a number of characters in their games. And then finally, there's this quote here, which we'll respond to in a moment. People should make the art that they come up with. If LGBT people want LGBT games, they should learn how to make games and make one. There is this sense of ownership. Even though they are no longer the one majority playing and making games, uh, cis men, and I was going to say white cis men, but we also have a huge audience in Japan and China and Korea, which have their own sense of misogyny and homophobia, which they bring to the table. But talking in terms of the West, white cis men feel they have an ownership over all video games. This is their old boys club. How dare you even stray in this direction? And slowly, this is being worn down. Now, that being said, the average gamer, the average white, cis, straight male gamer is not a bigot. They are playing like, you know, the uh, Last of Us, Last of Us Part 2, all of these games I've, sold, I've, told, I've spoken about have sold billions. So most gamers don't care. They just want to play a good game. This is a very outspoken minority who, when they get together, they have a lot of clout, and they can ruin people's lives. All your base are belong to us. This is a quote. If it's a nerdy quote, well done if you get it. But we're going to talk a bit about our ownership of games. So that quote there said, if you want LGBT representation in games, then you've got to make them yourselves. Fine. We have been. We have been making all kinds of games. It's one of those moments where I smirk. I am a queer historian, and I'm about to talk to you about Dream Daddy, a dad dating simulator for, for LGBT History Month, no less. So this is a game where you basically get to date hot dads. It's a really silly game, right? But they've included this deep representation where you can create a character that really feels like you. <coughs> Pardon me. So for example, this quote from Avery Delaney, 
I rarely saw trans characters in games, let alone ever had the option to be a gay trans dad who had given birth to his daughter. Such representation, especially positive representation, was groundbreaking and proved how easy it could be for developers to include trans characters in their games. It's really cool just to have the option there. Um, these are all games that have been produced by LGBTQ plus people or on topics uh, for LGBTQ plus people. So the top left image there is for a game called Dysphoria. Uh, Dysphoria uses old school arcade graphics to tell the story of a trans woman while she's transitioning. Gone Home is a game which feels a bit like an escape room or like a haunted house adventure until you realize it's the story of a young lesbian coming to terms with her identity. Bottom left, we have the game Lim. Lim explores the liminal state that queer people do where they pass or they don't pass. You play a colored square and you have to become the same color as other squares unless they attack you. My ex-boyfriend, the Space Tyrant, we have been playing stupid games created by cis heterosexual people for so long. Why don't we get to create stupid games for our audiences as well? Um, and bottom right, we are creating risque games. We are creating games that are specifically talking to the queer experience. Being a gay man in the 90s, meeting another man at the, a man at the urinal. Like this is not an uh, experience many cis het people are comfortable with. But we have been playing games that show the problematic complexity of cis heterosexuality so long. I've played games where the main character has an abusive boyfriend, or I've played games where people hook up in all kinds of places, but it's always heterosexual. And finally, we're starting to tell our own stories. These are some people that you could start looking into. Uh, again, I said, don't just take my word for it. The likes of Daniel Berry. So Daniel is a trans woman and she has created a, a very early game, one of the earlier games in the list called Mule, M-U-L-E, uh, which is basically a kind of like Dungeons and Dragons style quest text adventure that has informed many contemporary games. Maddie Thorson, they are a non-binary creator who created the games Celeste and Towerfall. Again, games are incredibly popular with huge audiences created by queer video game designers. That game with the Euro urinal, that was created by Robert Yang. Robert Yang creates these almost like art installation games about the queer experience, particularly playing with ideas of race and attractiveness and within the gay community, the problematic nature of using Grindr, these kind of things. Dan Bernardo is a queer man of color. Uh, he grew up in Brazil, an incredibly repressive family, but has used his experiences to found a video game company using the likes, uh, creating that's a grid force, where they have characters, characters you can play across the gender spectrum. Again, exploring race and identity within the LGBT games. And these are not just heavy art house games. These are fun video games. Video games are meant to be fun, right? They're meant to make you laugh and cry. They're meant to be addictive. All of this stuff you can find in queer games. Also, creators, queer artists are inspired by video games. We play games, right? So the likes of the drag queen Kimchi to the YouTuber ContraPoints to Sonic the Fox, drag artists, um, philosophers, writers, historians, we're all inspired by video games and we are taking video games and seeing them through a tr like a, a queer lens. What if you were to take the likes of Bomberman on the right and turn that into a drag outfit? How would you interpret Pokemon from a queer lens? We're finally taking up space. We are indeed the space invaders. Now, before I come to an end, this is my little expansion pack. These are some of the things that I think the industry needs to do better. We want a mainstream queer protagonist. Now, we've got The Last of Us. I would challenge people to mention many more mainstream games. There are a few in this list, but mainstream games with queer protagonists. Representations of queer people of color, not just white gay men and lesbians. 
Also, when they're lesbians, can they please not be served up for a cis heterosexual audience? Get lesbians to help you write lesbian characters. Non-binary and gender non-conforming characters. More of this, please. We get trans characters occasionally. Sometimes they're respectful, but they're always binary. Asexuality explored in characters, not just because a character doesn't want to sleep with you. That's not what asexuality means. And stop relying on tragic queer narratives. A lot of games feel like the character's sexuality or gender identity is like the big bad. Even The Last of Us 2, it's an apocalypse. And you are having to protect Lev, a trans character, because they are being chased by transphobic evil cults. This is an apocalypse. Have people not got something more to worry about? Not EastEnders. Your queerness does not have to be what is wrong with the world. More consultation with queer communities. Please stop making games without us because when you do, you make huge mistakes. And finally, Nintendo specifically, please do better. I am a gay man. I have a son and I was once part of a family. I, am a, I was a child in a family. Queer people and families are not a dichotomy. Being family friendly does not mean that you cannot have LGBT representation. So I really hope one day they can hear this message. And so without further ado, that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much uh, for attending. And uh, please, if there are any questions that have come up, um, please, please help me answer them. Thank you so much, Sasha. That was Fascinating and an incredible piece of research as well. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm going to jump straight into the questions. We'll get through as many as we can in the time that we've got. So the first one that we've got says, uh, amazing presentation, Sasha. So much I didn't know about. I feel I've missed out on so much. <laughs> There's been some controversy regarding the development of the upcoming Star Wars Eclipse as much about the culture of the organization developing the game as much as for what the game may deliver. What's your take on what this means for queer gamers and how the growing representation in gaming is driving and changing consumer expectations? <clears throat> That's a good question. I mean, so a good example, I mentioned Naughty Dog. I didn't go into great detail. They produced Last of Us. There's been a huge um, pressure on them for, for what we call gamer crunch, uh, which is where game developers are put in just untenable situations where they're working insane hours. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of them end up having nervous breakdowns. So just because you have a game company producing these great rep representations or trying to do good representation, if they're not treating their workers well, that's still a huge problem. Um, so... One of the things I worry about is it's become just recently cool to have some level of LGBT representation uh, because they know that on Twitter, on Instagram, they're going to get the kudos for having put or paid lip service to that representation. But the fact of the matter is queer representation is also about humanity. It's about being humane. And if you are treating your workers badly, it is inherently not good queer representation. Like you cannot just have a great character if it then turns out that the queer game makers are being treated terribly. Like that's that's not acceptable or okay. And I, I worry that some gamers, um, game companies will use it to mask really bad behavior. It's almost like sticking a rainbow sticker over the prob other problems they have. For example, you know, endemic racism in video game industries. And I would say that they all have to hang together. If you are treating your women terribly, it doesn't matter if you have a great gay character. If you are treat, you know, if you are treating your workers terribly, it doesn't matter whether there's LGBT representation. They they all have to happen together. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very mindful we're going to run out of time and I don't know whether you can stay on and answer some more I, questions, I'm Sasha. To. So I'm fine too. As if long. you've got the time to do yeah. that, then what I'll say to everybody, if you do need to drop off at half past, we'll keep going with the Q&A and we'll share the recording afterwards. So uh, let me plow on with the next question. Uh, much of the video game content you've shared has been very sexual, which is understandable. Uh, do you feel there are any games that show <clears throat> queer characters without the subject being a sexual one? Yeah. Um, so historically, that has very much been the case. This is how do cishet people see us? Well, they see us as our sexuality, right? This is a conversation I have all the time that 
being gay actually isn't about having sex. That's not actually what it is at all. There are some really nice examples. So a good example is like The Last of Us. Uh, sex comes into it because sex comes into it with every character. There's, there's some conversation there. But a lot of it is not about that. So there's some really interesting character development. So in The Last of Us Part Two, the lesbian character of Ellie and her relationship uh, with this, this bisexual woman, there is a sex moment. But I, I, how can I explain it? It, it doesn't feel over-sexualized. It feels beautiful. Like it feels earned. It feels like these two women care about each other and they fight with each other. You see friction, you see complexity. Neither of their character models are two hot girls. It's, it's more complex than that. They have conversations you see inside their minds. And I've seen more and more of that. Like, yeah, I think you can tell very quickly as a queer person, when you look at a character and you're like, this is a same sex relationship that is written for the enjoyment of heterosexual people or this is a trans character that has been sexualized to be served up to a cis audience. But I have seen characters when they talk about the complexity of their lives, the fullness of that, I have seen that in a number of games. Dragon Age Inquisition is of course another example. Um, I was gonna also mention, um, God, what's it called? Um, Brain's gone. The big space game. You know what I mean. Someone will pop it in the chat. The big RPG space game. Uh, Mass Effects is another example. There we go. Yes, <laughs> someone got there. So some, there are some very, very deep characters there too. We're moving away from that, but it is still a problem. One more little point I'd make. I also would like to see more sexy queer gay characters written by queer people because when you see a sexy sex scene between two gay men and it's been written by a gay man it feels legitimate it doesn't feel quite the same as when it's written by a heterosexual person so i'm fine as long as it's written for that audience yeah sorry go on to the question no that was great right the next one uh, are there many games out there that you feel offer good representation of bisexuality it often feels that it's incredibly fetishized as a sexuality or erased completely. So I really liked um, Hades, I mentioned. Uh, what I quite like about that is quite the matter of fact way it's played, where the protagonist has a relation. There's, there's two, but well, there's a few different characters, but two of the main characters that you can sort of have a relationship with as a man and as a woman they're both quite complex they're not like just happy they don't just instantly go yeah i'll have sex with you y you have to speak to them repeatedly but there's also an understanding that zagreus never has this big moment where he goes maybe i like men as well as women and no one comments like oh i'm really surprised that you're with a man as well as a woman it just sort of happens zagreus is just by just likes what he likes and and that that feels quite nice to see not a big thing being made out of it. That being said, I haven't seen many bi characters who talk about their bisexuality. A lot of the time they're a bit of a stock character where it's like, I like men and women, but you don't see the exploration of like, you know, my bi friends will talk about bi erasure, like the fact they will go to a gay club and if they're going with their, you know, opposite gender partner, everyone will presume they're straight. Like that kind of experience I've never seen explored or unpacked in a video game. Great stuff, right, we've got an observation here. Uh, you referred to CM, CM Ralph uh, uh, as gay and female. Is this actually known or have you just assumed this? They refer to themselves as they on their website. That's very interesting. If, if they have changed their pronouns, in the original LGBT archive, which has the biggest, like their, their work preserved, they were de described as a lesbian woman. If this has changed and I've been inaccurate in that sense, I apologize. I will go off and have another look. But at the time that was the only place I could access the game. That was the reference I saw at this stage. So apologies again to CM. If I have misgendered you, uh, I apologize profusely. That was just based on what I had read. Next question. Is it best to ignore or engage with the outspoken, bigoted minority? 
I despaired at the review bombing of Last of Us 2 and more recently the outpour of hate at the new Lord of the Rings TV show trailer for the inclusion of Black Elves, but I feel powerless. I feel you, I really do, and I think you are not alone. I think a lot of people are very frustrated. I would say you know when something is a good faith argument or not. If someone is coming to you raging, there's no, there's nothing you can say. And it's not for you to fight that. Like, don't take that on. I had a horrible experience over the weekend because an article I wrote about Vikings, about queer Vikings, uh, and I ended up having to close my Twitter account for a day because it got so unpleasant. What I would say is this kind of drama dies down very fast. Uh, it's often very hot for a moment. And then it's yesterday's chip paper. And then the truth often like will out. So yeah, you'll hear all this rage. Let's see what the audience numbers are for Lord of the Rings when it comes out. I bet they're going to be massive. Like, let's see who actually buys the game because Last of Us Part Two had no issue with sales. So it's this thing, of it, it's a manufactured outrage. So if someone comes to you and they're honestly on the fence and they're like, oh, I don't get it. You know, what is, why do we need to have these characters in games? and you think this is a legitimate approach, you can respond to that. But as soon as you realize that this person is just wasting your time and trying to make you feel miserable for an hour, step away. It is not for you. You, you don't want to step into that hornet's nest. What you can do, surround yourself with gamers who are playing great games. Talk to people who are into this kind of stuff and realize the honest fact is, the game um, industry is moving in this direction, not because it's cuddly and loves, loves being queer representative. It wants to make money. And guess what? Making money is being queerly inclusive. So like, in a sense, it doesn't matter what these people on 4chan are saying. The game industry is going to keep doing it because this is actually what people want. Thanks, Sasha. Next question. What are your thoughts about the representation of same-sex relationships in Fire Emblem Three Houses? So I've not played Three Houses. I've only played one Fire Emblem game. Now, what I will say is I know from talking to a number of friends that same-sex relationships are really problematic in Fire Emblem. I think I'm correct in saying uh, there's some really... There's, some, there's a kind of... Again, there's, there's a Western tradition of homophobia, and I'm probably not best you know, as a white dude to speak about this, but there is also like an Asian and uh, particularly a Japanese angle to homophobia, which is slightly different, um, which for example, comes from the whole boy love concept. So a whole a brand of anime and manga, which often has two uh, male protagonists falling in love. Often they, there is an age disparity, a power disparity. And sometimes it is exploring like physical abuse as being a kind of expression of love so it, it is problematic what i would say is problematic relationships are not just a problem with like representations of queer people um i think you know if you look at things like game of thrones there's been a whole conversation around like why are we celebrating which is basically like an abusive relationship that's something that i think i think the queer stuff that I've heard about from Fire Emblem seems to explore that sort of power dynamic, which I, I find creepy. I find it really creepy. Um, but it also has its own history that is important to understand uh, in anime and manga. Yeah, very good point. Right, final question, and then we will let you go, I promise. <laughs> final question is, any thoughts on platforms like, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing this correctly, is it Roblox or Roblox? Roblox. Roblox. Roblox, there you go. They seem interesting from this perspective. Lots of user-created niche games, mainly not dependent on revenue. My kids seem very unfazed by gender fluidity, et cetera. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. Like, my nephew plays Roblox. You know, I'm far too old for Roblox. Um, I have mixed feelings around Roblox because it's there's loads of YouTube creators who've made their entire careers around using this platform. And Roblox is a little bit like Minecraft. You can sort of create your own games and experiences there. Uh, there's not much, um, what's the word? No one is overseeing it. That's the thing that freaks me out a little bit, that people have created some really inappropriate and frightening stuff. You know, we're talking like neo-Nazi stuff being put out to like five-year-olds. But there is also the opportunity 
opportunity to create really cool, inclusive stuff. What I would say is that young people, I mean, young, young people, six, seven year olds, um, are exposed to a lot of stuff that they shouldn't be, but they are also remarkably discerning. They're very, they're actually more media literate than I ever was at that age. And as you said, they're very open-minded. I have never met a seven-year-old who's like, what? You know, <laughs> I can't believe that uh, um, Apollo fell in love with, uh, with, with Hyacinthus. Two men, that's disgusting. Like, that's not how a seven-year-old speaks. That's how the 47-year-old parent of the seven-year-old speaks. But, you know, kids are just like, sure, whatever. <laughs> like, every day is a surprise. So it, it doesn't rock their world at all. And I think there are some queer Roblox creators. And I think there are, you know, there's, there's some really good stuff. The only thing that makes me nervous is that these platforms aren't monitored. But then if they were monitored, who would be monitoring it? Because if it was being monitored by conservatives, they might remove all the queer stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. My, my nephew was addicted to Roblox, absolutely addicted. Right, that is definitely all we've got time for. I hope that you've seen some of the chat, Sasha, and seen some of the comments, really positive comments. Uh, everybody has thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. So thank you again for coming and speaking to us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of LGBT History Month. I'm sure that you have all sorts of things planned. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. Hope you've all enjoyed it. And uh, that's all for today. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you kindly. Take care. Bye-bye.